Hello, welcome to today's group meeting. The talk today is going to be given by uh, Thales, Thales or Rick Birch, and it's going to be about thermalization of particle detectors and the Andrew effect. And he's going to also talk about new results that he has and he's developing. So, uh, Thales, whenever you want, the floor is yours. Thanks, Edu. Well, yeah, as you said, uh, well, this talk is about thermalization of particle detectors in sort of a, a little bit more general. Uh, framework. And we're going to apply this to the under effect. So uh, this is work I've been doing uh, quotation marks alone, but no one does science alone anymore. So it's like I have to acknowledge uh, Adam, Jose Polo, Pipo, and Edo for discussions we, we've been having for the past months. And these have really helped me understand more about KMS states and, and lots of things related to this topic. Uh, so let me just... Yeah, okay. Uh, so yeah, uh, the outline of the talk, this talk is going to be split into six parts. Uh, first, I'm just briefly going to talk about Gibbs and KMS states. Um, just briefly review the notions and all of this. Then we're going to talk about thermality and QFT from, a, I don't know, from a perspective that uh, perhaps uh, some of you haven't seen before, hopefully. Uh, then we're going to talk about how to uh, introduce a time flow around a trajectory or the time flow associated to a trajectory in space now. And then we're going to talk about what I am calling a general particle detectors, but um, well, we should discuss the name later. And uh, then we're going to talk about the thermalization of these, of these uh, models. And finally, we're going to apply it to the under effect, and then we're going to go into the conclusions. So first of all, uh, uh, before actually going to the, the first topic and all this, I'd like to ask you to, well, I, I really want feedback on this. And this, this is why I, I wanted to be the first one in the calendar to present something, because I want feedback. I want discussion. I would like to discuss these things. So in the end, I actually have questions to you guys, because uh, this group is full of specialists in, in uh, thermality and QFT uh, or, or, well, well, yeah, the first law of quantum field thermodynamics was formulated by, by people that are here in the group. Uh, well, lots of people here have already worked on, with the UNREFAC, and AQFT is also part of all of these things, and we also have experts in this in the field. So uh, I'd like to discuss either later or during the talk, whatever. Um, yes, so please, uh, I would love to have you. <clears throat> so let's start. Uh, so uh, Gibbs and KMS states are the, the, the way that we try to give, uh, that we, we talk about um, thermal states or, or states in thermal equilibrium in quantum, field, uh, in quantum theory. And well, the, the idea is that if you have uh, a system that is uh, thermalized at a given, that is at a given temperature, then you put another system in contact with it. Well, they will, uh, after some time, thermalize. This is the, the classical idea of, of Thermalization, temperature, and in quantum in, in quantum mechanics, the, the way that we talk about this is uh, the, the simplest way to talk about this uh, is to talk about uh, Gibbs states. So um, a Gibbs state uh, is usually defined by this expression here. So you, you can see my cursor, right? Um, yep. Yeah. So uh, yeah. So a Gibbs state is defined by this expression here. Whenever the Hamiltonian is uh, Time independent and sufficiently well uh, behaved. And, and we're going to discuss a little bit about this subtle this. But the point is the Gibbs state is e to the minus beta h divided by z. And this is a way to reconcile uh, quantum mechanics with uh, some basics of statistical mechanics so that the, the probability of uh, finding the state in a given uh, place is proportional to the, this e to the minus beta, the, the energy of the, the state. And the partition function, of course, is what ensures the, the trace of this operator to be one. And it can be written as the trace of e to the minus beta h. Now, the thing is that uh, this doesn't work in general, right? I mean, if the Hamiltonian has a, a continuous spectrum or, or things like this, or if the trace of e to the minus beta h is just not defined, or if the exponential of minus beta h is just not well defined, then all of this description sort of breaks down. And that's where the KMS studies entered the game to try to generalize this notion to uh, more general quantum systems, right? So before talking about the KMS uh, states and things like this, I must talk about unitary time evolution. So I am assuming that we have a Hamiltonian which is time independent. Then the unitary time evolution operator will be given by e to the minus IHT. 
right? It will preserve the norm of the states. And moreover, I will be working the Heisenberg picture so that actually uh, I'm not gonna act with this operator on the states. I will act with this operator in the, the operators of the theory. So essentially we're going to define this, uh, one, this one parameter family of automorphisms that map operators to operators. And it will map the operator A into the operator, uh, into the time evolved version of this operator AFT, uh, which is given by this expression here. So just multiply it by U dagger by one side, then by U from the other. And that gives you the usual notion of time evolution of an operator. And then the, the KMS condition can be formulated as follows. So you say that rho is a KMS state of inverse temperature beta. Okay, so beta is the inverse temperature of the state, if it satisfies this condition here. Now, the thing is, it's not hard to see that the Gibbs states all satisfy this condition here. So Gibbs state at inverse temperature uh, beta satisfies this condition here. Uh, if you just, essentially the idea is to factor this minus beta into the IT that is here, and then you get this, this time evolution. The order of the operators gets swapped due to the fact that to have to multiply and divide by rho here and throw B to the other side. But it's sort of uh, possible to see that a Gibbs state of inverse temperature beta satisfies this KMS condition, right? And this is true for any operators A and B. This is very important to, to stress. So if you have a Gibbs state, it satisfies the KMS condition for any operators A and B. And conversely, any operator satisfies the KMS condition for, uh, um, for all operators is a Gibbs state. So if, if you have a, a state row that satisfies this condition here for the same beta for any choice of A and B, you can show that this row must be a Gibbs state whenever it is well-defined, of course. If you cannot talk about Gibbs states, this is not true. But whenever you can talk about Gibbs states, uh, uh, this, this theorem can be shown. So. What, what the KMS uh, condition actually gives us is uh, a more general notion of thermality. Sorry, or, uh, or, Thales, yeah. uh, yes. maybe you have mentioned this because I was uh, I had technical problems for a second. But just okay. looking at that slide, that's not the KMS condition, right? The KMS condition is missing a couple more things that are important. Did you mention? Yes, uh, you, you, you have to talk about, of course, right? The, there, there are some, I'm gonna try to skip through the, the actual mathematical uh, uh, details here regarding the analyticity and, and all of these things, because yes, the, these are important bits for the KMS condition, but also something that, that I'd like to discuss in the end is, um, I'm gonna try to save these these details, no, not details, but these- Right, uh, I mean, it's just because this is recorded and gonna be online. This is not, because this is a common misconception. I know you don't have it, but it is common in the literature. This is not the KMS condition with this alone. Where you not thermal, you can find counter examples and where you won't have thermalization or anything. You need more things. Perfect, perfect. On top of that. But yes, yeah, that's, but, but just also, mentioning also, that. Just keep going. Also, something something important. I mean, this is not the KMS condition that is used, for example, in, in uh, AQFT, because you wouldn't be able to talk about every operator in B. You'd restrict yourself to bounded operators. So this is sort of a a the thing is I, I'm trying to give a a, a sort of hand wavy uh, uh, definition here that, that I can use in order to do the computations. The, the mathematical details of this, I have some questions about this that I'd like to ask uh, the specialists in the group in the end, and hopefully I'll, I'll find some, some conditions. But yes, you're perfectly right. There are some analyticity conditions over this, uh, over the, the, the left-hand side of this expression that have to be uh, taken into account in order to actually uh, rephrase the KMS condition properly. Um, so you can't even but, say them, right? You need holomorphicity in a strip that is of the width of the beta in the complex plane of the extension to the complex plane of that real function. Yeah, Perfect, function that, that, is the, that is the condition. <laughs> uh, so uh, what really matters here is that this, this uh, KMS condition defines a more, notion, a more general notion of thermality, right? So it's, uh, you don't require the e to the minus beta h operator or its trace to be uh, defined, right? In order to talk about thermality. Nice. So with this, this is everything that I wanted to say about thermality in quantum mechanics. Now let's go to thermality in QFT. And um, so uh, thermality in QFT, the, the idea is that it's a little bit, uh, oh yeah, by the way, uh, Adam gave me his permission to use his image here. So yes, I'm not breaking any laws, but uh, yeah. So why did I use his image? Because he is one of the, if not the 
the group specialist in thermal and QFT. And uh, yeah, I'm not going to actually take the approach of processes and things like this. I, I'm just going to, to sort of, again, try to hand-wavingly uh, explain these the concepts that are relevant for these results here. Uh, and the, the, the most important one is that, well, you see, when we talk about the KMS condition here, it depends on this time parameter, right? On this time flow, on this time evolution. Now, whenever space-time is in the picture, whenever you're talking about space-time, uh, time is just not something that is uh, uh, like uniquely defined. Time is not something that comes naturally from the space-time or anything. It, it depends on a notion that you have to pick. So different observer exper observers experience different time and all this. So to talk about time flow and space times, uh, you have to make a choice, essentially. You have to define uh, a time-like vector field that will generate this time flow, essentially. Okay. And then if you pick, once you pick this time-like vector field that will generate this time flow, then this, uh, the time flow will be the, the, uh, this, 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 this one parameter family of, of uh, diffeomorphisms that will act in your space time that will map a point P to a, a corresponding point uh, gamma p of tau, where gamma p of tau is a solution to this differential equation here. So it's essentially, uh, uh, you start at p. So let's say that p is this point here. And then you solve the differential equation, with, uh, which is the curve that will be tangent to the, to the, um, the, the, the curve such that it's tangent will always be equal to the time like vector field chosen. So in this case, it is this the zeta. And then if you just follow that, you will get this flow. Then you can map regions into other regions. You can map points into other points. You can talk about the push forward, pull back, according to this uh, different morphisms. And everything works in this sense. So this is what I'm going to be calling the, the, the time flow or the, the, I'm always going to be associating this notion of time flow with the time like vector field. And then uh, having this, now we can talk about the operators in the quantum field theory and their evolution. Now, uh, operators in the quantum field theory, right? So uh, usually in AQFT, you, associate, you assign um, an algebra of observables A to each um, open region of space-time. And then this, this algebra of observables, it's related to this mirrored version of the actual fields that we use in quantum field theory. And there are lots of, of details here that have to be considered and all this. I'm not going to be talking about them, OK? I'm just going to be talking about the phi of x every single time. You can think of this as an operator value distribution or whatever. And I do have questions about how to actually, uh, 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 under which conditions I can draw this x on, on uh, on this picture above, and I'd like to discuss them in the end of the talk. So, uh, but yes, for now, let's just do standard quantum field theory with a phi of x operator, and that's it, okay? So again, I'm ignoring some formality issues here, but I'd like to discuss them uh, in the end for sure. So uh, now what happens is that we're considering a general quantum field theory, right? So uh, we're gonna consider a general quantum field theory, and this means that the, the operators, they're not necessarily the scalar operators. We can talk about operators that are tensor values, essentially. So I can talk about, even the case of a scalar field theory, we can talk about nabla mu phi. Nabla mu phi, the total covariant derivative of phi, or d, d phi, whatever you want, this is a rank zero one tensor. And these, these objects, they are present in, in quantum field theories, and we're going to be talking about them. So let's see how time evolution acts on them. Uh, of course, uh, here uh, I'm going to be using this uh, a little way here. Uh, um, this little way here is for any collection of Lorentz indices. So these may be spinner indices, these may be space time indices, whatever you want, any combination of these uh, upwards indices, uh, indices down, up, whatever you want, any combination of these, any number of them. Okay, so this is a general uh, tensor value operator. And then uh, the, the time evolution, okay, associated to this, uh, uh, to the time flow in due, in, associated with the, the time like vector field zeta will be essentially uh, something that will map operators into uh, time evolution of these, these operators, right? Into the time evolved version of these operators. Here, I have written uh, LH for linear operators in a Hilbert space. It's more general than this. It's actually 
associated to the local algebra of, uh, of uh, operators associated to the quantum field theory and all this. But uh, again, let's try to avoid the, the real formal issues here and look at this, at these things. Now, what happens is that um, if I'm mapping A to its time evolved version, I do know how to perform this calculation in the quantum mechanical uh, space, which is essentially by using the unitary time evolution operator, which is generated by the Hamiltonian and stuff. But you see that the, there's an index here. There are indices in general here. So how does the time evolution act on, on vectors, tensors in general? Well, the answer is uh, it acts according to uh, the flow of this time-like vector field, uh, zeta. So essentially, the, the, the vectors evolve according to the push forward with respect to this flow. Yeah, Jose Polo, I see you have a question or a comment. You know, I, I just wanted to know that uh, that x with the math SF, that's a space-time parameter, right? Or yes, that's a space-time position, yeah. OK, OK, sure. Yeah. No, go on. Yeah. So just just to clarify, again, I'm just I am uh, talking about the usual quantum field theory where we assign operators to each point of space time, or operator value distributions, whatever. Right? You know, so. it's it's just that I um, well I, I'm I'm having troubles uh, making sense of what should should we mm, yeah how should we interpret the time evolution alpha tau of something that's already defined in an interaction picture so that it depends on the space time in this index. So, so uh, this is not, so the typical thing is that you define them in space in a Cauchy surface, right? And then you have a Hamiltonian flow and that's what you follow in the free one. I think that if, I think that X should probably be referring to a spatial one in a Cauchy surface, right? And and that's what probably well, what you mean. it's a point yeah. in space time, and then you can yeah, evolve I, the operator from that yeah. point onward in time. Yeah, that's it's what I was thinking. Simple as that. Yeah, so that's yeah, what that yeah. I'm just clarifying for Jose. Not saying that is wrong. This is what is. Yeah, no, I know that. That's why I asked if it was a space time or just defining a Cauchy surface. Yeah. Oh yes, but it's like every point belongs to a Cauchy surface in a space time that. Oh, careful with that. There are very weird space times, but yeah. No, yeah. <laughs> in any space time that possesses such surface. Yes, but yeah, in any but regular enough space, you can always yeah. find out. Uh, yeah. yeah, but but in this case, he he definitely he can take global hyperbolicity, but I don't think he doesn't need it partly because he's using a globe the existence of global time function, right? I'm not ever saying that this this uh, zeta vector field is defined globally. It's just it defines a local notion of time evolution within its domain, essentially. But so, um, and that's where this this. this Time evolution is well defined. So if you have a, a smear field, for instance, with an F, and you move this F around in space and time, you get something like this, right? Uh, yeah, th then the thing is that you'd have to essentially uh, move both, right? Both the F yeah, I mean, and the So one that joined up the other, in the sense that you have this thing that is an integral of F, you move F around, yeah. and you say that that's an automorphism because it moves the operator around in a way, too. Oh yeah, perfect, perfect. Yeah, that, that's a way of, of seeing this. So perfect. I mean, yeah. it doesn't have to be exactly time evolution. You can it's any group of transformations that you have on the space of functions, uh, right? I mean, for instance, uh, no, yes. You... In this case, I'm talking about time evolution, but yes, yes. Yeah. yeah. So so alpha tau is like a sub probably a one parameter subgroup of the automorphisms on that thing, right? Um, yeah, yeah, but, yeah, but yeah. it's assuming that partial tau is a time like vector. So in the end, it's a time evolution. But yeah, I mean, in principle, you don't need to call it time evolution so far, no? But I mean, it, it, I mean, well, it is case... time evolution with respect to this notion of time that is introduced by the by zeta. Yeah. Yeah, but, but in in this case, since uh, since a of x, you're already considering that it's defined in in all space time. Alpha tau is just the uh, yeah, the effect I'm not saying that X like ranges over every single possible space time point. I'm saying that X is a space time point. Well, well, okay. So uh, at least uh, on a region, it's defined on a region of space time, uh, which is um, uh, which in particular contains all the orbits of your tau uh, parameter, right? Uh, I mean, right? Uh, all the orbits of your tau parameter? Yeah, it's like the flow. Within the whole domain of, of zeta, yeah. 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 Within yeah. the whole domain of zeta, yeah. Then, then the effect of alpha tau is just uh, moving around the x, right? Is it, you, you can express it like A of something, uh, of a transformation of x. 
Well, it depends. It, it, okay, yes. So there, there are two things that you can do, right? So the first one is uh, you have the A defined at this point, you have the A defined the other one, and then you just look at the A in the other one, which is when you're already assuming that you have the A defined everywhere according to the to the evolution to the uh, uh, interaction picture and all this. But the other thing that you can do is just like pretend that you don't know A in the future, look at A at this point, then evolve it according to the Hamiltonian flow associated with this uh, uh, notion of time evolution that is prescribed by this this uh, time like vector field zeta. Then you will get, uh, I mean, you will get there, right? Yeah, the okay. End. Yeah, sure, sorry. Yeah, maybe I'm, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just making circles. But yeah, I'd like to discuss the formalities in the oh. end. It, okay. it, it would be better, I think. But uh, but yeah, there, there are lots of things that are not explicitly like uh, uh, being said here and that I'd like to discuss for sure. But it's just that uh, otherwise the presentation is going to take like hours. <laughs> sure. So let's, uh, let's no, no, no. leave the hours for the discussion. I think it's going to be better. Um, but yeah. Uh, so. Uh, again, we have seen that the KMS condition, it regards two point functions, right, of, of operators. So uh, let's then consider two tensor valued operators, and we're going to have to talk about their, uh, their two point functions, right? So the two point functions between two tensor valued operators, it's going to be a bi tensor, so it's going to depend on two uh, space like uh, points, uh, two space time points, two space time events, and it will be a tensor of rank equal to the sum. Of the ranks of the tensors. So that's the idea. So this tensor product that you see here is a tensor product in space time, not in not within the, the Hilbert space of whatever. It's just this is the tensor uh, product in space time that, that will give this essentially. Okay. So you're going to produce a bi tensor out of these, and this was, will correspond to the uh, correlation function uh, between two points of the between two space time points in a given space uh, row of these two operators. And then now that we have all of the tools that we need, we have the time evolution, we have the, um, we have the, 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 the notion of what a two-point function is for tensor valued operators, then we can actually define the, the KMS condition. We can talk about it in quantum field theory uh, in general, like for, for general operators. And this will uh, be essentially what we had before with an elasticity conditions, as Eduardo said, then all of this. But uh, it will essentially be that the this this uh, uh, periodicity in in imaginary time with period beta beta would be associated to the inverse temperature, and um, you have to swap the order of the operators in order for everything to work. So this is the this would this would be what we will use as the KMS condition, and then it can be shown that if rho is a KMS state, then uh, the following. Uh, stationarity property holds. So, so the idea is that if you decide to time evolve both A and B, uh, this will only depend on the difference between the time parameters of A and B. Okay. So this can be shown by using the GNS uh, representation associated with this. All that, not going to enter much details, many details. OK. So um, with this, we have this, this notion of the KMS foundation. I'm just going to rephrase it in terms of the detailed balance condition. So in order to do this, I would just define the, the, the two-point function such that the first operator or the correlation function such that the first operator evolves in time as C tau and the two-point function such that the second operator evolves in time as C bar tau. And then the KMS condition can be rephrased as simply, well, C tau with AB equals uh, C bar tau plus I beta BA, and that's it. And then uh, from this, it's possible to then define the Fourier transform with respect to the time parameter associated to the flow of zeta tau. And then if you define this Fourier transform, then you obtain this uh, detailed balance condition that essentially, so C tilde at uh, omega equals e to the minus beta omega, C bar tilde at minus omega with the order of the operators um, swapped. Okay, so this is the so-called uh, detailed balance condition, and it's equivalent to the KMS. Again, there are uh, mathematical details I'm not providing, but they are equivalent, uh, taking these things under consideration. Nice. So important remarks. Uh, in relativistic setups, uh, thermality and temperature depend on a notion of time flow. Okay, you do depend on this family 
alpha tau of on this one parameter family of uh, automorphisms, you depend on a notion of time evolution in order to talk about temperature in QFT. And the second thing uh, I hadn't said it before, but it's interesting. It's the uh, Tomita Takesaki theorem that says that every state is thermal with respect to the appropriate notion of time evolution. Okay, so this is what I wanted to say about uh, thermality in QFT. So, so one thing, uh, Thales, you say in yeah. relativistic setups. Why? I mean, not true. If this is true uh, universally in all quantum systems, in all systems, thermality and temperature depend on a notion of time flow, and also every state is thermal with respect to appropriate notion of time flow. These two things would be true also non-relativistically. Well, the second one is true, even non-relativistic. Okay, the first one. one is also true. The only thing is, is that whenever you're handling relativity, it's like you have to pick. You know, it's natural to think about the notion of time flow that you will pick. While when uh, standard quantum mechanics, it's like there is a unique that's already associated to Hamiltonian and all this. Like no, but in you classical not think mechanics, about... you have different different Hamiltonian vectors that generate Hamiltonian flows. See what I mean? And and there, there's a notion of thermality for each of them. Classically, without relativity, in classical mechanics. Sorry. Classically, I mean, classically or quantum, and also in, in quantum system, when it's not relativistic, you also have different Hamiltonian flows uh, that are generated by different Hamiltonian vectors, right? And they define different notions of normality. So I think this, these two important remarks, it could be misleading to say in relativistic setups, because maybe it in the reader, oh, this doesn't exist if it's non-relativistic. I think both are true non-relativistically as well. I know time is have to be more careful to in time relativistic systems, but the statements as, as claim, I think, are true universally. Okay. Uh, can you go through the second statement? To like just say a little bit more. Are you talking to me or are you talking to Edu? Hey, you too, you too. <laughs> okay, yeah, the second statement, the, the, the Tomita Takisaki theory. Yeah, so, well, more like the every state is a thermal state respect to the proper notion. Yeah, what do you want me to, to I mean? So, I mean, no, I mean, people, the way that works is there's always a Hamiltonian for which a state is thermal. If it's entangled. Say again? If the state is entangled, right? Well, that's what I understand from the Tomita no, Takisaki. No, not necessarily, no. What do you mean entangled? For entangled, you need partitions. Well, how do you make the partitions? You can always make the, partitions. The thing is that the equivalent to partitions in Tomita Takisaki the uh, theory, as far as I understand, I may be wrong on all this, eh? but it requires a cyclic and separating vector and all that stuff. Yeah, that's right. Yes, you do need a cyclic and separating vector. Which yes. is the kind of like, uh, with respect to subalgebra, that are the kind of the partitions. So you that's kind of like requiring that you need to have an entangled state respect to a partition. Yes, but that's the thing. To have thermality, you need to have a multipartite system always. And then the multipartite system that you're considering, that says you can do the partitions whichever way you want. But you should be able to do partitions. And then you will always find a way of Well, but then partition. it's not true that every state is thermal with respect to a time flow, right? It, it the average the should have like quotation marks. It's true. Like, yeah. but like give me there, a counter example, here. Jose. Give me a counter example, and uh, I'll give you a way to build it, adding extra stuff to the system. Which Jose? Was that? Which Jose? You, you, I, I think, think the only one. Who... <laughs> so okay, 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 okay. Th think about think about a counter example. What would be a state that is not thermal respect to some notion of time flow? Um. Well, I would have to think yeah, about it. But, uh, examples so, of states. Is I mean, there are conditions that they need to satisfy, but they're pretty reasonable conditions. So the problem is that the, the, when you vary time flows in a non-relativistic setup, mm -hmm. uh, it's not clear that you're not the, that you're varying the, the partitions of the system because there's no causal structure. Right. So I don't know for a qubit or whatever, like I don't know what it means to change first the notion of time flow. Oh, for a qubit is very simple. The change the notion of time flow is think of it as changing the Hamiltonian flow. Any state of a qubit is thermal with respect to some Hamiltonian uh, that I always can find a Hamiltonian for which the state is a ground state. Therefore it's a zero, if it's a pure state, so it's a zero temperature state for some Hamiltonian. And also a mixed state, I can find a Hamiltonian for which that's the exponential minus beta h. Okay, so when we're saying time flows here, we're saying Hamiltonians. Yes, that's what I was actually uh, punctualizing here. Yes, yes, indeed. Well, but in relativistic you systems, you have to associate it with a time flow, with a partial T, a time-like vector, and so on. But in non-relativistic systems, you can always find 
a state will always be thermal for some Hamiltonian flow with respect to the time evolution of, with respect to some Hamiltonian flow. But I mean, so when you're varying Hamiltonian flows, then so the problem that they have is with the, the entropy. I mean, mm -hmm. yeah, what's the problem when you vary the around like a, when, when you vary Hamiltonians and you have the same state, and unless you're uh, making the state the, the system smaller when you're uh, writing that Hamiltonian or something like that, I don't know. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't see how, I mean, maybe uh, I have like a couple of things mixed here in my in my head, right? Like, um, I think maybe the statement is, uh, because I have like the, the impression that they, they're like geometrical thing going on, like uh, you're like an actual time flow in a relativistic sense. And also this thing of changing Hamiltonians that not un maybe I'm not understanding very well. So, so the one thing that is, let me just say something that is, I think, uncontroversial. If you give me a state of a quantum, well, forget about relativity, quantum mechanics. If you give me a state, I can always find a Hamiltonian for which that's a thermal state. No, because the, if you give me a state that has zero entropy. Uh, the ground state, that would be a thermal state of temperature zero. You can find a Hamiltonian. Okay, so you can always a find a, uh, for any, you, you, the, the claim is that the, the is that the state is the ground state for some Hamiltonian. That's correct, yeah. And any mixed state, any mixed state would be the, uh, a thermal state for some Hamiltonian. That's is that true? You can invert that, that relation. I think so, yes. Well, it's it definitely in finite dimensions, it's trivial. In infinite dimensions, it's more complicated, obviously. Uh, so you have e to the beta h, and yeah. you're saying that you that's... Take the log, wrong. and you find the h. <laughs> uh, and you have the spectral okay. theorem telling you that that exists, so... Okay. Anyway, for finite dimensions... Well, sorry for the interruption. It's just yeah, like yeah. I was confused uh, with the statement. But no, but these, these things are interesting too. This is interesting discuss. anyway. So yeah, please, uh, let's keep going. Yeah, because maybe the talk will take forever. And we don't have for... We have finite yeah. time only, unfortunately, right? Unfortunately. <laughs> All right. Uh, yeah, okay. So just, yeah, we talked about Gibbs states. We talked about uh, KMS condition in, in QFD. Nice. Next step then will be to talk about uh, the time flow around the trajectory. So um, the thing is, uh, yes, we, we're going to use this to relate to detectors and all this. And the idea is to use Fermi normal coordinates as usual. If you've ever seen any talk that I've ever given in my life, probably talked about the Fermi normal coordinates. The idea is that uh, given a time like curve in, in a space time, then uh, you can always locally define these Fermi normal coordinates around it. The idea is that at a given in, instant of the proper time of the curve, you get the tangent vector to the curve. Then you uh, exponentiate every single uh, space-like vector that's orthogonal to it. Then you will get uh, the rest space surfaces associated to this observer. And uh, what will happen is that the, the Fermi normal coordinates, they are coordinates that such that the, the space-like portion of these coordinates is always associated with the, the proper distance between any point in the in the surface and the, the curve itself. And also it naturally encompasses the twists and loops that the curve might have, the, the curvature of space-time and all this, everything is encompassed by the Fermi normal coordinates, okay? So uh, these are a, a natural coordinate system to consider whenever you're describing something um, around a time-like trajectory. And there is physical content to it uh, regarding the, the proper distance that, in, that is encompassed in Xi and all of that. And uh, one of the reasons why the, the Fermi normal coordinates uh, are so uh, useful or, or good for, for these, uh, for describing things that are close enough to time like curves is the fact that uh, you can actually find a very nice uh, expansion for the metric components in Fermi normal coordinates. Um, in terms of the, the proper distance between uh, events in the surfaces and the curve. So these would be the, the expansions. These expansions are given in terms of the acceleration of the, of the trajectory and the space-time curvature along the trajectory itself. Uh, you can find much more about it in, in this Poisson paper 
it's great to explain fermionormal coordinates by tensors and all of this. And but now let's talk about the the thing that we're actually here to talk about, which is a time flow induced around the trajectory. Okay. So the idea is that uh, this this uh, whenever you define the the fermionormal coordinates locally around the curve you get this, this partial tau vector field, right? Which is the coordinate vector field associated to the partial tau, uh, to, the, to the trajectories that have constant psi, essentially. These trajectories, they will sort of uh, be trajectories around your curve, and they will define these, these, this uh, time-like vector field partial tau, essentially, okay? And uh, the, the idea here is that, um, well, it's, it's it's natural to think of this as a notion of time flow, and it, it is a notion of time flow because it is a time-like vector field, but it's very important to stress that depending on the geometrical properties of both space-time and the, the properties of the curve, these partial tau will not necessarily be normalized vector fields outside the, 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 the curve itself. So what happens, actually the redshift factor between the constant, the, the curves with, with constant uh, xi zero and the, the, the actual curve, the, the curve where, where we're basing our, our Fermi normal coordinates is given here again as an expansion in, in curvature and acceleration. And uh, yes, so the thing is, you do generate a local notion of time flow, but if you want to think of uh, as mirrored system, an extended system, for example, and you want to consider these partial tau as generating the time flow that would be seen by an observer sitting down at psi equals constant, then actually uh, it's only true that this partial tau will correspond to the four velocity of these, these, um, of these curves or approximately correspond to the four velocity if these terms are small. If the, the, the psi zero is close enough to the curve uh, compared with the acceleration and curvature of space time. So, the, the lesson to be taken here is that uh, partial tau does define an ocean of time evolution, but it does not correspond to the proper time experienced by an observer on constant size zero. There are some correction terms. It approximately corresponds to that if uh, acceleration times the proper distance or the, uh, the curvature times the proper distance squared are, uh, is small. Okay? So this is important to, to keep in mind. And then uh, with this, th this is everything I wanted to say uh, regarding uh, regarding uh, Fermi normal coordinates and regarding how to induce a time flow around the trajectory. Now let's talk about these uh, general particle detectors. So a particle detector model, uh, at least for me, is, is a localized and relativistic quantum system that couples to quantum field theory. This is the usual notion of, of particle detectors that is used in the literature. So I decided to consider a, a sort of general model that gets an arbitrary non-relativistic quantum system that opposed uh, to an arbitrary operator in a quantum field theory, and that is uh, localized. So let's see what I mean by this. The thing is, um, if it's a non-relativistic system, okay, then it's like, it's a, essentially it's not a quantum field theory. So it's a zero dimensional quantum field theory. It must be supported along a curve. So we pick a time like curve, Z of tau, nice. And we pick any quantum system, any, uh, any quantum system that we want that is defined along this curve. Um, so there's a Hilbert space associated to it and time evolution within this, this non-relativistic quantum mechanical system happens with respect to the proper time of the curve. Now, the interaction with the quantum field theory uh, is prescribed by an interaction from Newtonian density that looks like this, where I'm considering uh, any operator in a quantum field theory away with any collection of Lorentz indices, again, uh, the, the space-time smearing function, which is uh, any function that is uh, supported locally around the curve and has the same uh, Lorentz indices as O in order to be contracted with it. So for example, if O is a spinner, this would be the, the barred spinner. Or if O is a two tensor, this would be a two tensor, but with the indices down uh, and so on. And uh, this mu here is an operator in the, in, the, in, the quantum, in the quantum system. There are some conditions over it, but well, in principle, it could be any operator. So let's just uh, 
go through every single one of these like uh, carefully, yeah. So lambda is just a coupling constant, right? It's a small real number so that we can perform expansions on it and everything works. Uh, mu of tau, as I said, it's any operator in the detector's Hilbert space. And uh, I will assume that this uh, hi of x is already in the interaction picture. This OA is any operator in the quantum field theory, self-adjoint or not, with any collection of Lorentz indices, doesn't matter. And this lambda is a space-time smearing tensor field that is uh, reasonably localized around the, the curve. So uh, this is just like the sort of uh, generalization of whatever we had in these in these papers here, uh, but now for for higher um, for higher spin on the um, on the operator and in the space-time smearing. That's not a space-time smearing uh, function anymore. It's a space-time smearing. Uh, space-time smearing tensor field. Uh, thanks, Edu, for pointing out that the year is missing. Uh, so the what happens here is that the, the intuitive picture right associated with this interaction is that well, you have this mu of tau, which is an operator defined along this the z of tau. You have the lambda a of x, which is just uh, a tensor field that is uh, supported in a sort of this tube around the detector. And then uh, the OA is just lying around in space time. The detector is probing it it's, uh, along this, this region here. And then you obtain the, the results of this interaction. Right? So uh, I will also be using a rigidity condition on this, on this detect third that is a condition over the space times mirroring tensor field. So I'm going to assume that it can be written as chi of tau times f of x. So uh, tau is the proper transit trajectory. And uh, this by itself, this equation by itself says absolutely nothing, right? Unless I specify some conditions over f. And I will specify the following condition over f. I'll say that uh, there is a frame that is transported according uh, to the flow of the of the of the Fermi normal coordinates associated with the detector's trajectory. Okay, so this phi tau is the flow associated with the partial tau vector field. So there is a frame that is transported uh, according to this, such that uh, the components of f in that frame are constant, uh, are only depend on the space time, on the space part of the Fermi normal coordinates. So essentially, uh, this frame is already following sort of the trajectory, of the, the motion of the detector locally around it. And I'm prescribing this vector field in such a way that uh, it's also transported according to this law, because uh, its components are essentially constant in the in time, at least in the um, in the in this frame. Right? So with this, we can rewrite the interaction Hamiltonian as uh, in these in the Fermi normal coordinates associated to the detector's motion as uh, the coupling constant. A now a switching function chi of tau. A general, uh, a general mu of tau operator, the same one as before, but now uh, the the instead of having the contraction of the full space time smearing function with OA, now we have this contraction here, and these f's only depend on the space time on the space coordinates of the Fermi normal coordinates. So from now on, I'm always going to be assuming that uh, the the Lorentz indices are evaluated. Um, in this frame, essentially. So in this frame that is transported according to the flow of tau. And this will also make our lives easier because then the, the essentially the time, we, we don't have to think about the time evolution of the, uh, of the tensor part of this tensor valued operator. We only have to think about the time evolution of the components themselves because the frame is already transported according to the flow of this uh, phi tau. So with this, uh, this is the interaction Hamiltonian, and let's look at the transition probability, right? So it's possible to show that the transition probability, so first, right, before, <laughs> before doing this, uh, let's focus on a subspace, okay, of the big Hilbert space that we have defined in along the trajectory. Well, maybe big, maybe small, doesn't matter. Point is, let's look at transitions from an initial state i to a final state n, okay? And uh, so, okay, let's look at these transitions. And then it's possible to show that the transition probability will take this shape here, okay, under these assumptions there. 
Now, this is very similar to what we have in the UDW, standard UDW detector, right? Uh, this omega here is just the, the energy gap between the state N and I. But now you must be wondering what on earth is WIN? Well, uh, this WIN of tau tau prime, it's actually <laughs> not a very uh, pleasant guy to, to work with, but it's possible to. So let's take a look at it. It's given by this, uh, th th this combination of four integrals of two point functions. Where do they come from, right? Uh, so, and also what are these uh, mu coefficients? So first of all, the mu coefficients, nothing to worry about. It's just the, 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 comp the components of the, the mu uh, operator in the I n basis, nice. Now the Ws. The Ws are uh, associated with two point functions of the field. So uh, these two point functions, the idea is that these arrows are associated with the amount of inces up that you have in these W functions that are smeared with respect to the uh, detector smearing space, space part of the uh, smearing, right? And of course, I have to use the, the, the metric determinant and all of that uh, in Fermi normal coordinates, okay? And uh, now these Ws, they are all of the possible uh, two-point functions that can arise out of the Hamiltonian that was picked. So you have O with O, O dagger with O, O with O dagger, and O dagger with O dagger. So in the end, these arrows, and of course the, the, the indices here are also associated with where the, the Lorentz indices are. So with this, uh, these, these arrows here are essentially telling you uh, whether O is conjugated or not in the two-point function that is being smeared, okay? So uh, here, this means that no O is conjugated, both are unconjugated. This means that the first one is not conjugated, the second one is, so to be the one corresponding to this, this. Uh, this one is, first one is conjugated, the second one isn't, and the last one, both of them are conjugated, okay? So why am I giving you these uh, full expressions and all of this? because I do intend to actually make a computation with you. I know I shouldn't in a, do this in a presentation, but uh, I will, I'm sorry. Uh, uh, sorry. I think it's uh, gonna work. Carlos, can yeah, I ask something fine. stupid? So so the mu, right? Yeah. Is the operator that would have been the analog of the monopole for the qubits, right? For the case of the standard UDW detector, yes, it would yes. be the monopole, yeah. So uh, is there a reason why I should be able to assume that the mu like for so the mu will be in general a linear combination of stuff that raises or lowers the the states right yes is that a reason perfect. why i should believe that they all share the same spatial smearing space time smearing well so um this comes out of the this essentially, right? Of the, yeah. of the interaction Hamiltonian. Yeah. No, yeah. I get your question. Let me just uh, so let me say the following. Okay, so if you want to put different mirrorings, then you can. Uh. No, I, I'm thinking about it this way, right? Because if even for dipole coupling, right, you think the the smearing is fixed by atomic orbitals, right? Mm -hmm. So Ericsson, yeah. this, this is already including that. See, look that you have an F star plus HC there. Uh, uh, and yeah, the Hermitian no, no, no. no, no. takes into uh, No, it's the, not the, because the mu, right, can have like zero to one, zero to two, zero to three and stuff. Oh, right? yeah, that's and right. That, that is he's correct. saying that you can take all these things together. For dipole coupling, you happen to yeah. only have two and you can account them like, like you can account them by just a function and it's conjugate, right? Okay, okay. But in okay. general, this is like a very harmonic oscillator kind yeah, of thing. But again, it's not really, so you are mixing, you're right, but you're mixing two things, right? It, uh, a monopole moment doesn't have to be two levels. A dipole moment doesn't have to be two levels. And a multiple moment, you can reduce to two levels. No, but I'm restricting to the subspace here. So it's like, hold it's on, hold only on. a four by four. I'm actually right? saying that you're right. I'm talking about Ericsson, that you mix into things, not, not you. Uh, uh, this is only restricted to a, to a subspace of two levels, right? If that's the case, there's only one function. It's only one f. Okay, so 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 that's that's, that's where I want to clarify. So i and n are just two states and not arbitrary two states of the the detector. Is that it? it I'm fixing. Like it, yes. Wait, uh, I didn't because understand your question actually. Erickson, sorry. So if you don't restrict to two levels, the the smearing function 
Uh, that ah, it could be different always. Uh, it is actually saying. in realistic it, scenarios. It has to be different. Ah, because I see, I see, see. You are restricting to two levels, and that's not no, related I with monopoles yes, or anything. Yes, yes, yes. You yes, can yes, restrict yes. to two okay. levels for monopoles, for dipoles, for quadruples. That's not related. So that's the thing I want to disentangle from the same. Yeah, yeah, no, yeah, that's, but, but that's yes, no, but this is perfect. This was a very, very nice observation, actually. Very, very nice, actually. Yeah. Okay, yeah. Okay. Because if, so, if he is restricting to two states, then yes, I agree with you, Eduardo, but it doesn't look to me that he is. So that's oh, what it I'm says there, right? The subspace I n is two states. Yeah, yeah, but but before this, like before the sentence here, like this interaction Hamiltonian here, it's not general in this sense, no. right? But we have exactly. written the yeah. general Hamiltonians are written in all those papers. You have a sum over all the levels. <laughs> yeah, it would be exactly exactly. It would be a sum over f i n and mu restricted yes. to the i n subspace. Yeah, it's also in, in principle. Go ahead. No, I, I just want to say that yes, maybe maybe it's just a presentation thing, but in general, you have to sum over all possible f's for every transition, no, right. right? Yeah, no, you're. There's also right. a problem with the indices, right? Because if you go to the in the notation for the presentation, you go to the next slide, you use a and b uh, in two different meanings. I I noticed that you as, 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 in, as tensor indices and also as noting the, the levels in which you have. Yeah, so yeah, here the, then, yeah, the mu a b here, the a and b. It's supposed to be fixed from the beginning, right? To That's be two right. particular subspace, right? Otherwise, you yeah, it's either I n or n n or yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, that's fine. That's fine. And also notice that mu doesn't have to be self-adjoint, right? So, for example, in the case of of yeah, in the case of um, in the case of the the antiparticle detectors and stuff, this mu would just be sigma plus, right? Which is not self-adjoint by any means. Right. So here I'm um, also considering this this sort of phase, right? So yeah, that's fine. That's fine. That's fine. That's fine. And this will be important. So that's why oh, I have I to write mu thing... ni, mu i n star, mu i n and i and all of this. The whole things. thing, the whole thing is solved by saying that you restrict into two levels. And also the notation is not the best, right? In terms of no, no, yeah, yeah. So if it is restricted to level lens, then everything goes through, right? That's fine. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. Perfect. All right. So uh with this. Let's see whether or not we can use these guys there to, to probe temperature, right? So uh, first, what is a thermometer? Well, for me, a thermometer is a device that uh, gives it a temperature of the thermostat, okay? That, that's how I'm defining a, a temperature for me, me for this presentation. Uh, if you have anything against this definition, uh, please say something now or save it for the end of the presentation, but yeah. Uh, okay, uh, and then the question is, can a particle detector be used as a thermometer? So under which conditions can we uh, read out the KMS temperature of a state using a particle detector? Okay, so this is, this is the question that I want to, to address here in essence. Well, first, as we discussed in the beginning, uh, the notion of thermality in QFT depends on a notion of time evolution, right? And the detector defines a local notion of time evolution. It undergoes this local notion of time evolution. Right? So this means that if the detector is to probe something that is thermal, it has to be thermal with respect to the same notion of time of evolution that the detector experiences. So actually, the, the question we want to address is, uh, can a detector probe the temperature of a state that is KMS with respect to the time evolution associated with the detector itself? Okay. This means essentially that uh, using tau as the proper time parameter of the detector, and, and all of this, we will then uh, assume to have a, a KMS, a, a field in a state that is KMS with respect to this local notion of time evolution that is induced by the detector. Okay, so it will satisfy uh, the KMS condition here for any two operators A and B, and it will also satisfy the, the stationarity condition that we discussed earlier. Okay, with respect again to the local notion of time evolution induced by the detector. Now, uh, using these two conditions, we can now explore what's gonna happen, for example, with the excitation probabilities and things like this. Well, uh, first, uh, let's see what happens with the two-point functions of the state in Fermi normal coordinates that are already uh, naturally adapted to this flow. So the idea is that uh, because uh, of stationarity, all of these W functions will actually only depend on the time difference, tau minus tau prime. So I'm only going to write one slot here for the time. This should be understood as tau minus tau, uh, tau prime. And um, what happens is that because of the KMS condition, you get that you can essentially swap the order of these guys, provided that you 
advance in time or go back in time. Okay, so this is the implication of the KMS conditions to these two point functions that show up in the in the probability. Okay, so essentially you get this. Uh, uh, you have to swap the indices. You have to swap the xi and xi prime, and you you get this uh, anti periodicity in imaginary time, which is characteristic of of Whiteman functions of two point functions, uh, whenever you have a thermal state. So nice. Uh, then, what's the implication to the actual uh, function that uh, defines our probability there? The win function, the win of tau tau prime. Well, uh, as we have seen, it's given by this uh, combination of w with indices up, down, and all that, and the mu's. Now, these w's there, uh, because of this, these conditions here, the w's will also satisfy anti periodicity conditions. Okay. And this change of psi with psi prime is perfect for showing that, uh, well, for showing these complex anti-periodicity conditions. Then notice that the W with two uh, uh, arrows up is mapped into the W with two arrows up, two arrows down to two arrows down, but the one with the one arrow up, so uh, unconjugated uh, two-point function and conjugated, this goes to conjugated, unconjugated. Right with the anti-periodicity condition, and the actual implication that we get out of this is that if we look at the the wyn at tau plus i beta, what happens is well, this term here uh, stays the same except for the fact that, that you get a minus tau here. This term here stays the same except for the fact that you get a minus tau. But these terms here they get swapped because the w uh, the w up arrow and down arrow and w down arrow up arrow, they swap places because of the KMS condition in this case. And then what it, what happens here in the end is that uh, the the KMS condition uh, that is that is uh, implied to this to this WIN function is actually that WIN of tau plus i beta is WNI of minus tau, which will essentially map excitation probability to the excitation probability, as we will see uh, soon. And also, of course, we have the detailed balance condition, which is just the Fourier transform of this uh, with respect to the detector's proper time here, right? So, uh, so we get these two conditions for the WIN function, or WNI, whatever. Uh, thus, um, oh, yes, yeah, sir. Thus, um, we're, we're going to be able to apply this to our transition probability. And really, essentially, we're going to talk about the EDR ratio and, and see up to which extent we can recover the transition probability. But before that, uh, it's important to say that uh, thermalization takes time, right? This is an important part whenever you're talking about uh, uh, thermalization. So what I'm going to do is that I'm going to use this very standard procedure, which is to rescale the switching function by t. So essentially, if we had a chi of tau, such that its integral would be 1, then I'm going to talk about chi of tau divided by t. So essentially, I will be, as t increases, I will be uh, 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 increasing this effective time where the interaction takes place. So in the, in the tube version, I would be increasing the, the size of the tube. Right? Uh, of the space-time uh, smearing function, smearing tensor in this case. And then uh, the integral of the chi of tau divided by t will simply be the, the, the standard time uh, duration of the interaction. Nice. So with this, uh, we can actually rewrite the using the stationarity and uh, the, the, this rescale of the, the switching we actually obtain that if the time that the interaction takes is t, then the excitation probability can be written like this, and the de-excitation probability can be written like this, where the still this here, all of them denote the, the Fourier transform with respect to the, to the proper time uh, of the detector. And then with this, uh, we can actually compute the, the ratio between these probabilities after using the detailed balance condition. So essentially, we apply the detailed balance condition to this thing here. This is very similar to what was done by uh, Edu and people in when they studied the general effect for the, the scalar model. 
and the, the reverse and reflect as well. And then what happens is that you get this ratio here, right? Which is something that uh, was also studied by, by Kuster, uh, Benito, and Yorma. Uh, you get this ratio here. And then this ratio here, it's easy to see that if you take the limit of t going to infinity, then this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero, this term goes to zero. This doesn't depend on t comes out and the two integrals cancel. So essentially, uh, the limit of t going to infinity of this ratio gives us e to the minus beta omega, which means that it is possible to recover the KMS temperature of the state. So, so beta, go, go back, go back. Yeah. There is something you haven't said, but again, it's because I talk, I know you know it and I know it's, it's cool and so on, and you're trying yeah. not to get to in the details, but those are things that to me are important and often overlooked. Mm -hmm. It's not quite true. You need to make, a, it's not the assumption of infinite time, it's the adiabatic, right, uh, switching limit, plus the part of the KMS condition that you have not actually specified in order to get here. There are two things that are used. The, so, so you see, in the integral in the numerator, you cannot really say that the exponential goes to zero for very large t, because you're integrating over omega for all values of omega. So there's yeah, always I, an omega yeah. large enough. The condition that is implicitly said here is that the Fourier transform of the switching square, modulus square, kills the UV fast enough so that in the limit, that term doesn't contribute. But again, that needs to be said, and that's called the adiabatic switching. Not every switching satisfies that. So if you switch forever, but you switch very suddenly at the beginning and at the end, this will not be satisfied depending on how you do it. There's an extra yeah. condition. Um, I was your... going to talk about this in the ah, you are. Oh, the okay. yeah, yes. It's because yeah. you just said it here, then I won't say more. <laughs> oh no, I just <laughs> wanted to get the punchline and then the conclusions, I will reveal the assumptions for this to work. Okay, okay, fair enough. Just yeah. saying just in case. Yeah, <laughs> yeah okay. <laughs> yeah, so actually it is possible to... So the thing is, this, this is saying that any particle detector that couples to any field operator but you're still going to be able to, to recover the KMS temperature, like for this set, right? Any particle detector, any field operator. So what are the actual assumptions for this to, to stay, to work, right? So first, of course, the field state must be thermal with respect to the time evolution of the detector. This is super important, right? Uh, now, the second one is a condition regarding the detector. Right. So remember that we discussed about how uh, partial tau defines this notion of time evolution. But uh, what we want to think when we construct the, the particle detector models is essentially that uh, when we say that the detector is rigid or something like this, we want to say that the internal constituents of the detector are undergoing these trajectories and are probing the quantum field uh, at these points. So this means that we want to say that the partial tau vector field, we want to say that the, the, um, the, yeah, the, this time flow, this partial tau vector field, it is, it, it does correspond to the proper time of the detectors, right? So, uh, so it's, it is important that these two terms here are, are, are small, at least within the, the support of the of the space mirroring, right? Or essentially, if some? you if, yes, please. Uh, I think that, that this thing is very interesting. This thing that you're talking about the that the that number has to be small because it's like a new thing for me, uh, right? So how small has to how has the detector have to be to to see this thing at uh, an acceleration that is large enough? So we can thermalize. What are the... So, yeah, the, the, the condition is essentially here, right? So if, hmm. so for example, for a scalar uh, particle detector, right, right? You'd get the F of X, that would be the space, only space mirroring. Then you multiply that by Xi I, you integrate that over the slice. That will give you a dipole moment of the, of the switching, right? Then if you multiply that by A, and that number is small enough, then you're fine. And okay. for, for the case of curvature, you would have to compute the quadrupole moment and then contract it with curvature. If you have a, a, a vector valued or a tensor valued uh, field, then it gets a little bit trickier in the sense that 
what you actually have to do is to get the dipole of the tensor, but that's fine, you can compute it. Then you contract it with A, it's still going to be a tensor. Then you get the norm of that. That has to be small, but yeah. But it's but always possible to talk about these things. I assume that you have all the details for this in the thing that I have, have. I do, I do, I do. <laughs> I just decided not to put here because otherwise it would be too long. Yeah. Because, I because what I mean is like uh, intuitively, it's it seems to me that there will be a conspiracy of scales. I mean, I may be wrong here, of course, because I'm going by intuition. By that, I mean that, uh, that of course, the particular shape of the smearing matters, the particular smear of the, of the switching, if you want, matters in that approximation, because those things appear in integrals in frequency domain, and is the UV is, okay, there are two things. There's an IR problem and a UV problem in the thermalization of the detector. The IR problem is the one related to size, and I can believe that the IR problem is solved with these assumptions. The UV problem, which is precisely related with this Fourier transform, what is the Fourier transform kind of controls, they would also be um, there if you have a, a smear detector and you have curvature and acceleration that is brutal and so on, and in there, I would expect a conspiracy of scales, not a non-trivial solution. For the IR one, I believe, yes, that probably you can get something like that. So uh, what do you mean by the, the conspiracy in the UV problem? Like right. one? The shape of the detector matter. I can have a detector that could be very localized, but the shape is so rough that has the Fourier transform is not localized at all. And uh, ah, I see what you're saying. Okay. And, and that would also screw up uh, thermalization. The same way. No, but imagine. but provided that provided that like the the dipole of that is well, because you see the space, the shape of the space profile of the interaction, that doesn't matter in this sense, right? The the Fourier oh, transform it's, again, of that can be a point, up. but you can be. No, a but the point. Fourier transform of that doesn't show up. The Fourier transform in the probability, yes, in the Fourier transform of the profiles well, shows up indeed. Well, it depends. It depends on what you are calling that. But the thing is, what shows us the smearing of the Whiteman of the two-point function mm -hmm. between the two operators with the two uh, uh, space profiles. That's what shows up there. Right. But the, the, in, the, in the integral that you showed, for example, before, in, if you have the delocalized case, something like that, yeah. If you have yeah, the delocalized case, yeah. in the end, you're going to get contributions that go like the Fourier transform of the smearing. So, so Eduardo, I agree you with you. Yeah. Sorry, 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 my bad. Sorry, sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Okay. I wanted to understand the, what the, the problem. So no, you're saying that if the detector is very localized, uh, then the detector doesn't thermalize? No, no. It depends. So it's the same way that we have an adiabatic limit. So it's saying, oh, so if you don't wait infinite time, the detector doesn't thermalize? So, well, I mean, yeah. you have to switch carefully. You have to control something about the UV behavior of the way in which you switch. I would expect something similar to happen with the smearing. Yeah, you need to go to a point. But, but I think, but I think you, 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 with the switching alone, you fulfill the condition. So you don't need the smearing It depends, to... right? Because I can have uh, some very ill smearing that the Fourier transform of that and thus the wellness that ah, the okay. switching does. See what I mean? So I'm mean, talking in general terms. In general terms, I guess one can think... I'm just going out of intuition, though, so I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong in what I'm saying, but I would expect. I don't know that... if you have the uh -huh. the product of the smearing, the Fourier transform of the smearing, and the Fourier transform of the switching. You just need one to cut the whole thing off. The UV of the other one doesn't matter, right? It depends. I can have a I can have a switching that, uh, for example, imagine that the smearing is something really weird, that, and thus you have a very imagine that you have a switching that does it, but only by the minimum amount. So some polynomial tape that precisely works enough to work, just the one that is enough. And imagine that I have a Fourier transform of the, of the smearing that does not decay. Uh, somehow I have a very spiky form or something. I mean, it will always decay like one over K, I guess. So maybe, okay, if it needs to be normalized, probably you're right that, this, that the smearing cannot screw it up because at the very least should have something like one over K, right, in frequency. So maybe that, maybe yeah, that. Okay, I see, I see what you mean. Yeah, but that you could have like a, a very wild like a, like a triangle kind Sorry. of or like like a triangle kind of switching and then if you have a box type of uh, smearing you that's right that would cancel each other that, that gives you one k up and one k down <laughs> so so that that's may right. cancel the what the switching did for you again i'm just going off intuition so Thales has done the calculations and probably can tell me no no that doesn't matter but it's something to be careful about though because even though you do have a space integral here in the end, the behavior in the UV, you can work in the, you can introduce Fourier transform here, work in the frequency domain and see if the integrals will be all convergent uh, uh, more rigorously. 
So in the frequency domain time, I will talk about it like one step further during that slide. But the the about the shape of the detector, I'm just assuming that these Fs are are well, I'm gonna say it's infinity, but like they are they're regular enough. And and yeah, the normal you need the tensor on it. Do is one. Yeah, once yeah. integrated but you yeah. need assumptions in it but it's also so another thing is the metric too i would imagine that um the the scale of how regular they are conspires with the acceleration and curvature scales to tell you if you can do it in a curve space time that's all that i mean so if you assume they're nice enough pretty sure it will work you can find maybe gaussians mirroring that it's okay in most in unless you have a super ill space time but i would imagine that there's some conspiracy of scales as well with the shape of the detector and the acceleration and curvature scale. Also, have another doubt. If for one Kelvin of the Andrew temperature, how small has the detector have to be? I mean, it's just like out of the blue, but maybe it's super small or something. That's what I that's uh, what, what I asked before. Yeah, the, the the restriction is gonna be great, right? Because I mean, I, I mean, I haven't done the explicit uh, computational numbers, but the thing is. Uh, when Kelvin means huge acceleration, right? You have to isolate the yeah, yeah. acceleration in terms of the, the temperature, which means very small detector. It's one over that essentially uh, in the correct units. So okay, so this is very cool because a natural limit to yeah. and something that has to do exclusively with the angle effect. Not there's not a thermal behavior. It's like it's a relativistic thing, right? It's like. Um, uh, you, there's a natural limit on how that you have to have something very small to be able to actually probe an acceleration. Yeah. Yes, well. Yeah, to probe the temperature and that is associated with thing, yes. right? It's yeah, very, very but, interesting. Uh, unless you and it's not only the effect, actually. This is this is valid for, well, circularly uniform, circular trajectories or whatever, right? You can have, like, yeah, mm. whatever. So it's like, uh, uh, what really matters is the... This is like A of tau and R of tau in the end, mm. right? So any trajectory yeah. that you find, if you find a state that is KMS with respect to the notion, low, local notion of time flow induced by this uh, uh, trajectory, everything here is true as well, right? Everything. Yeah, well, so but the idea is that the, the angle effect has the characteristic that you have the angle temperature, right? That is like a very small temperature for ordinary accelerations. In other trajectories, you may have a, a, this may not be that relevant in the sense that, so you really want to prove that the, the detector is in a therm, is probing something thermal, mm -hmm. you need to accelerate it a lot, which means that it has to be very small to be constrained in that trajectory. I think that's very cool. Again, it depends now, also of what temperature you want to detect, right? I mean, you can go to temperatures that are, uh, you know, a, 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 a million for a fraction of a millionth of a Kelvin, then your scale will go up like that, right? So it depends on how sensitive you are, your detector. The size depends on the sensitivity of the detector in a way. If you can detect really small temperatures, then you don't, you can maybe get thermalization even for, you know, larger detectors in that sense. Yeah, that's, a, yeah, that's another thing, yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's very cool, yeah, because I mean, so this is like, kind of like puts like another layer in the box of how would you measure the, this thing, right? Yeah. Well, it was a limitation on the size of the system for sure, on the, the system, yeah. Super cool. Thanks. <laughs> and yeah, now the thing that Eduardo has already spoiled, so yeah, <laughs> I mean, the other thing is that the interaction has to last for long times, but what is meant by long times? Well, you need these guys here to be to go to zero as t goes to infinity, right? And how do you do it? Exactly like I just said, it depends on the the, the cho choice of switching function that you pick, such that uh, uh, the modes that will be probed in the end in, in this long time limit will well essentially the conditions that the Fourier transform of the switching must be localized enough compared to this uh, t, essentially. And then with this, uh, you're fine and you can do your stuff. And it, I don't know, do you want to say more about this? Uh, you already so said a lot, also so the, that's why I'm not To get those expressions too, you also need to use the part of the KMS condition that you haven't said is the KMS condition. So without assuming that you have holomorphicity on the stripe, there's no way to get to this expression. 
that needs to be the case. If only with a per complex periodicity is not enough to get through. So that's why it's important, above all for people who are with detectors, right? Well, it's important for everybody, but in particular for people who are with detectors, if you just say, oh, KMS is the com complex anti-periodicity thing that you show, you won't get this detail balance. You need to use that. And no, also, yeah, because course, you need it for every omega. Yeah, yeah. That's right. And uh, in order to get the Fourier transform of the, for, for the rest stationary response, in order to get the Fourier transform of the Weinman there. And mm -hmm. the one thing, and the one thing that, um, that, uh, that is actually important, I think is very important, I mean, many papers have been written about this, is uh, what does it mean to be long times properly, right? I mean, decaying enough. This is the notion of adiabatic switching, then the, is the notion that we need the switching to be, uh, have, ideally have one scale that controls both the smoothness and the duration. Uh, so long times also means that it takes forever to switch on. If you have a finite amount of time that it takes to switch on and a finite amount of time that it takes to switch off, and the middle is what you let go forever, that would not be enough. That won't cut it. You actually need to be switching on at the same speed. The speed of the switching activation has to be the same as the duration of the whole interaction. That's the adiabatic assumption. Very slow switching. Very careful in order to thermalize. And that is, the, and that is not a physical assumption in that sense. It's, it's the one that makes sense. It's the one that... Talking about the infinite limits is usually ill-defined. Infinite time limit is ill-defined. There's, there's one way of making it well-defined, which is the adiabatic assumption. So I would even argue stronger, and now, now we enter, get out of the typical knowledge and into my own opinion on this. I don't think uh, that you can talk about the long time switching, the, the long time limit for detectors, unless you're actually doing something about the adiabatic, you're talking about the adiabatic limit. Any other, uh, any other way is ill-defined. The integrals don't commute with the limits, and then you get nonsense answers, most of the time infinite answers, sometimes not infinite, but also nonsense. The only way in which you can commute these two limits is the assumption that what you mean by the interaction that, that lasts forever is the adiabatic way of lasting forever. But then again, that is just out of a little bit out of, just saying these assumptions are kind of important on the technical side, above all if we want to characterize what does it mean for something to thermalize, right? Or what does it mean mm -hmm. to thermalize in the under effect case in particular? Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah. It's not true. It's not just being picky, right? In maybe you have some theories, some micro violations, some microscopic scales of Lorentz invariant or something like that, and those things respect the complex antiperiodicity, but screw up maybe the other part of the KMS condition. Oh, there you go. You have a test for quantum gravity right there, because this thing won't thermalize them. <laughs> See what I mean? So I think those yeah. things, those details, the devil is in the details here, and they're important, and you know them. Though. I know you know them. So it's not me. No, yeah, I just decided to strip the data out of what I had because yeah maybe I should have added most of them I don't know I mean well, that doesn't so. matter we did discuss them so <laughs> yeah, yeah that's that's what matters <laughs> if, if you yeah. are talking with a different audience people that don't know that much I think it would make sense to at least mention those details yeah, but then this will take like hours I wouldn't be able to you know <laughs> now, when you talk about this right when you present what your results to an audience right yeah. Well, oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. I do. And taking advantage that we are talking about this. Um, yeah, you see, in all the calculations I've seen, in which um, which there are problems when you don't use the adiabatic limit. It's uh, well, I mean, when, when you try other models, it's because you have two scales and so on. So, have you ever seen a place where maybe the scale of the um, switching of the switch of the of the switching off of the interaction? Um, because, for example, imagine, imagine I have like um, yeah, a flat interaction for a sigma time, and then I switch it in at, at a scale that is related to sigma. Um, then I then I can deal with that because because I I, I only have one uh, I I only have one scale uh, involved, and therefore I don't have to look at the commutation of the limits or whatever. So. My idea would be if, if uh, I mean, of course, if, if that if the scale of the of switching off is uh, just a multiple of, of sigma, then you are going to have just the um, the same just the uh, an adiabatic limit, and that, that's going to be all. But if uh, if you have something like the scale is going is going with a square, yeah, two, two scale switching, yes, ramp up, duration, and ramp down, yes. No, 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 no. One scale, but uh, the, the scale is sigma, but the, the scale of the switching off. It's related to sigma in in a, in a functional way instead of just a multiple mm -hmm. of sigma, for example, that would be would give you yeah. just the same result as a an adi adi okay. adiabatic switching off. You can have, for example, a square root of sigma. Yeah. So my, my point would be if if you can find that for a switching off that goes with sigma to the one over n, you still have the adiabatic limit. Then in the end, when you take n going to infinity, you can maybe you can make those things commit. I, I don't know. 
I, I just I need to convert. So the, that 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 depends in the in the infinite limit. Uh, they need to convert to the same thing. All the adiabatic, there's you're saying maybe there's no unique way of defining the adiabatic limit, and there isn't. It doesn't matter. I can even use. No, no. Go ahead. Yeah. No, that, that what I mean is that if, if the, the if the switching off goes with sigma to the one over n. Yeah, sigma... that exists. You can do it with a Lorentzian or with a Gaussian, and in both you get the adiabatic limit and the same result in the infinite time limit. You know, but but, but what, what I mean is that is the, if the scale of switching off is a if is a an, an nth root of the of the scale of the interaction. Then, when taking n uh, big enough, you are going to have something very similar to a step function in the end. Yeah, it depends on the dimension. So this is a case which ones are enough in terms of functional dependence to satisfy the adiabatic switching condition. That depends on the dimensions of space, the space time that you have. It depends on the decays of the Wyman. You basically need the integral to commute with the limit. Yeah, no, no, I, I know. I, I was just well, I, it's fine. I, I was just wondering if you could model it in a in a way that that is that that resembles better something that is similar to as as the function as the function even if it you can not. yes you can do it so again you can go with a Gaussian and a Lorentzian a Lorentzian is closer to a step function in that sense and or you can do you can do splines that are the scales are related you can do it. Whether okay. you can do it or not, it depends on the dimensions of space time, the space time you have, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay, sure. Yeah, yeah, I, I think we've talked about this already. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Anyway. Yeah, yeah, I guess so. yeah. Let's let's uh, let, right. let Thales finish the talk, right? Yeah, so it's just a last step, which is to apply uh, this to the under effect, right? Super short, super easy. Uh, so well, what is the under effect? Uh, the under effect is this phenomena of point of view theory in flat space times uh, is this prediction, if you will, of flat space time point of view theory that states that uh, uniformly accelerated observers experience a thermal bath of temperature uh, proportional to their acceleration. And the proportionality constant, uh, you can see it here, it's 1 divided by 2 pi times 1 times 1, so 1 divided by 2 pi. Um, so nice. And well, uh, so Rindler coordinates are, are a very, very natural way to talk about uniformly accelerated trajectories. Uh, so essentially, uh, Rindler coordinates are these coordinates that you can see here on the right, right? So they cover this so called Rindler wedge, so a quarter of Minkowski space time. And uh, uh, if x, t, y, and z are inertial coordinates, then the, the um, Rindler coordinates can be written as uh, zeta, uh, cosh rho, and then for the, for the space part, so for the time part, zeta, cinch rho. And th then the matrix looks essentially like this. Okay? And uh, there's this result by, uh, from 1975 and 76 by Bizanano and Wickman that state that the Minkowski vacuum is a KMS state with respect to the time flow induced by a partial rho with inverse temperature to pi. Um, this is true for any point of view theory that respects CPT. That's what they, they have showed essentially. And well, so now if you're looking at this and you've never seen this result, <laughs> you're probably going to be wondering, hey, shouldn't it be 2 pi over a the inverse temperature? Shouldn't temperature be proportional to the acceleration? Where is the acceleration here? Well, the answer is mm, not with respect to this time flow, right? I mean, this time flow does not correspond to any, well, not to any, but, but it corresponds to a uniformly uh, accelerated observer with uh, acceleration equals to 1, in essence. So, so that's why it doesn't. Uh, correspond to that. So the thing is, if you want to get the, the, the temperature associated with an observer that undergoes a uniformly accelerated trajectory with acceleration A, what you're going to get is essentially, well, you, you should do, is to use um, Rindler coordinates associated with this uh, uh, motion, right, with this acceleration A. And then if you do that, uh, what's going to happen is that the metric is going to look like this. But most importantly, the, the partial tau vector field that you will get out of the proper time of the, the uniformly accelerated detector with the acceleration A will be uh, related essentially with the partial row 
<laughs> by this factor, factor of A in the end. And then with this, you will get that you will uh, uh, go faster through the wedges or slower depending on the whether this acceleration is larger or smaller than one. But then you will get this two pi over A factor over the on the inverse temperature that on the on the actual um, on the actual um, uh, inverse temperature that is experienced by a uniformly accelerated observer with acceleration A. Okay, so that would be these are the 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 this is all uh, yeah th this is how the under effect can be justified by means of uh, talking about time flow and KMS states. But to talk about what one observer sees, you have to go to get into the Fermi normal coordinates associated with that observer. And in the case of a uniformly accelerated observer, the Fermi normal coordinates are these or something equivalent, except for a small shift in X. But the thing is that these are the Fermi normal coordinates and these are the coordinates that will give you the actual temperature that will be experienced by this uh, uniformly accelerated observer. And then of course, we, we already discussed it. Uh, this means that uh, um, a sufficiently small particle detector would be able to probe uh, this temperature, or at least you'd be able to recover this temperature by means of the excitation, the excitation ratio, right? And then, uh, yes. And of course, the, the, uh, the, the condition there, the condition of uh, sufficiently uh, of the, the the condition over the, the, the smearing, essentially, right? Uh, it can be, so to talk about this, let's do the following. Consider the trajectories that move with constant like big X, right? So if the uniformly accelerated trajectory we are considering is, for example, this one, consider uh, the other trajectory, which is, for example, here. Then the thing is, this trajectory here is not going to experience a acceleration of A. It will actually accelerate, it's, its acceleration will actually be A divided by one plus AX. So yeah, it's a different acceleration for this uh, trajectory. So in principle, you might wonder, hey, but doesn't it mean that then this bit of the detector here will experience another under temperature? And well, in principle, it would, and that is why it's so important to have AX small in order for a smear to test for this whole uh, uh, discussion regarding smear detectors and how small the detectors have to be in order for this, this phenomena to, to work in the sense, for this description to work. So you see, although this bit of the detector exper uh, experiences a different temperature, because it undergoes a, a, a different acceleration. Still, if the detector is small enough, within the detector is mirroring, it will be true that everyone will be accelerated approximately with acceleration A. And then we're fine, it will actually thermalize to uh, A divided by two pi and not any other trajectory. So again, it's very important that this condition over the, this mirroring is very important. And this is the end. This is the end of the presentation, right? Uh, so the conclusion is that, uh, yeah, it's this long sentence. I'm gonna read it to you. Particle detectors that couple to a field state that is KMS with respect to the detector's notion of time evolution, thermalize to the corresponding KMS temperature of the state. Thermalize quotation marks because actually I've only talked about the about how to recover the temperature and the EDR ratio. This is actually one of the many questions that I have, but uh, like regarding how much we can talk about uh, thermality just out of the DDR ratio, but yeah. And yeah, this works for any non-relativistic quantum system that couples to an arbitrary operator of a quantum field theory. And the any there has a little star because this, of course it uh, depends on the rigidity of the system and how, uh, 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 how uh, localized it is essentially around the trajectory. And as I do uh, mention, maybe I should have added this here. It also, the, the, the switching also matters a lot for this to hold. So yeah, this is the end of the, the presentation. I don't have a final slide. 
<laughs> but that's the end of the, the presentation, these conclusions here. Uh, thank you so much for your time. And now I'd like to take questions and ask questions as well. <laughs> Right. So yeah, I don't know. Uh, yeah, thanks, Edu. Thanks. The, um, the in terms of time, uh, yeah, we need to finish by two if we want to do everything that we want to do. But uh, yeah, yes. let's let's go with and I need to talk a little bit about logistics after. So let's go with the questions first. Okay. Uh, okay. Can I ask one very short question? Sure. Okay. One slide before this. One slide before this. Yeah. Essentially, this. Essentially, this condition is the usual bond rigidity, right? So, the, are we saying that the, the 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 standard rigidity will automatically coincide with Fermi rigidity, or or I guess another way to think about this is that how do I enforce rigidity at, at using the smearing function? So, if it's just a, a, a standard like smearing function, then it's uh, it's very easy. The, the smearing function cannot depend on time, period, and you're done, right? If it doesn't depend on the proper time, it only depends on the on the just gives you a shape in each slice, then you're fine. Uh, in, the the frame, in, in the frame of the center of mass. So if it's a right. scalar, if it's a scalar field theory, then the switching fun then the smearing function is a scalar. The problem is regarding the 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 tensor, uh the tensor smearing function, right? Or the, the vector smearing uh, function or, or whatever. And then actually the rigidity condition is related to the flow, the one that I'm using here at least, is related to the flow according to the partial tau uh, to vector field, essentially. That is the, the condition over the, the frame of this, this uh, where you define the, the, the smearing. So this means essentially the following. Define your, your space-time smearing at a given uh, time slice. Let it evolve according to the flow. This means, Push, forward, push it forward according to the flow of this partial, of this local notion of time evolution around the trajectory. This must be a uh, constant, essentially, according to this flow. And that is the, the notion of rigidity that I'm using here. So the notion of rigidity that makes sense to me, the one that is related to internal cohesion forces, is the one that we've always used for the scalar case. And that's related to the fact that uh, the proper distance to all the points of the smearing from the center of mass of the smearing there is the same, is constant, which is the same as saying that this, the spatial distribution is not time dependent in the proper frame, in the Fermi Walker frame of the center of mass. Yeah, but if you have vectors, it gets a little bit trickier, right? Well, it gets transformed, right? But that's, but what I, but yeah, still, but it gets yeah, transformed yeah, according to this flow. That's yeah, another, yeah, but that's then the there's, but there's the support, right? There's the support. The support should be still rigid, even if it gets trans the vector gets transformed. The support in space time. Oh yeah, but it will exactly be uh, exactly because the so essentially the, the being invariant with respect to the to the time flow generated by partial tau. Essentially, this means that you are that you are. So, because the psi corresponds to the to the proper to the proper distance, right? Essentially, being variant under the uh, phi tau star under the push forward with respect to the flow means being constant in time. That's the thing. Right. It's not. I'm not doing anything. I'm just uh, translating the the being independent of the proper time of the detector to a to a covariant formulas you know it's a covariant way of talking about this mm -hmm. in which you have to push forward everything with respect to this time flow and make it uh invariant in the sense yep. if you don't have any other questions i do have some questions <laughs> i have one question yeah it please was, Adam. yeah it was on the uh part of the kind of state of the field uh, uh, now at the at the end. At the end. Yeah, the the on the under effect. Yeah. The under effect. Okay. Yeah. It was like, like I got confused in in which sense, 
did you say that the acceleration was one here? Like, oh, you, it's because I'm using know. this this row here, right? Which is associated to these coordinates here. These are the coordinates, the proper coordinates of an observer of acceleration one. <laughs> if, you want. if you shift the zeta coordinates. If you shift, that's you the thing. shift yeah. the coordinates, but doesn't matter because it's translational environment. Yeah, the shift, yeah. exactly. So it's like, the, the thing is that- It's um, missing the A, yeah. Yeah, if you put an A here, then you will be able to relate it with the Fermi-Walker coordinates, if you will, of the uniformly accelerated observer. But like, uh, set A equals one in this thing here and shift the X back and you'll get exactly what you had there, right? I mean, th these tau X are also called real. I mean, you can find many places in which these are called also real like coordinates. Because yeah, they are real actually, like coordinates. They're called adapted, adapted yeah. real so, like coordinates. That, that's why. The thing yeah. is, uh, if you go to Wikipedia, you're gonna find like, five different Rindler coordinates. If you like, go to my general relativity notes, I call this adapted Rindler coordinates. <laughs> okay, nice. So to the observer with proper acceleration aid. That's that's super fair. And these are also the Fermi normal coordinates associated with them, yeah. But yeah, then uh, was this your question or? Yes, I think so. Yeah, thanks. Like one thing that confuses me is that then when you have these coordinates, do you stay in a constant x on the image right. yeah you do constant uh, in, in, a, in a constant uh, x yeah you go through constant x indeed if you only evolve according to row in yeah. these coordinates here yes you but this is always true right whenever you you <laughs> you're considering the flow according to one of the coordinate vector fields then every other coordinate will stay constant and you only evolve uh, with respect to that one. That's guaranteed by the fact that this is a coordinate basis that you're using. These yeah. things are coordinates indeed. Exactly. Okay, thank you. Yeah, it was a bit confused because I thought like you had to go with a fixed acceleration at x that you didn't have choice. It's so funny though that you got confused by this because this is done usually to simplify. In fact, Thales could have omitted this. There was no reason to talk about this, but that confused you. That is the, this very simplified. Those are generic green coordinates. There's a generic Rindler map. I didn't tell you what the row is. It's a generic Rindler map. And indeed, in those coordinates, right? If you want to ask, what are the coordinate curves of constant x? And those are, oh, those are hyperbolas. Of, of um, hyperbolas of focus equals one. <laughs> you know, like the axis, the, the length of the axis of the hyperbola is one. So see what I mean? Like this is just a choice of coordinates for flat space time. And this, in this choice of coordinates for flat space time, the constant x curves, the coordinate curves, are those hyperbolas there. Yeah, it's just that, um, like, this parameterizes the whole Rindler wedge, right? So, what is the curve here that has uh, acceleration one? Well, it would be the curve with uh, essentially zeta equals one here, right? But uh, uh, you can parameterize every single one. Uh, and, but that's exactly why, in the end, I decided to, to choose the, the, um, this Fermi normal coordinate system in the end. Because here, x equals 0 really gives you the trajectory, which actually has coordinates like the standard coordinates, um, Sench and Kosh, right? But uh, here, it's like x equals zero gives you the the curve you're talking about, and it only evolves in time, in, in time tau. And yeah, I don't know how. It doesn't matter. So the, in the previous one, the, the, it's not the, the previous one, that one is not the proper frame, if you want, of anybody, really, because the person sitting at position zero goes at the speed of light. So this is just a map, if you want, between flat space time or one wedge of, of Minkowski space time to, uh, to uh, co hyperbolic coordinates. This, uh, this is actually differential geometry wise. Let me choose hyperbolic coordinates <laughs> for flat space time. And this is what you get. And in particular, you can think, aha, in these coordinates, I can describe the trajectory of any observer that's accelerating as constant x. Sure, that's true. But then a different question is, oh, what is the proper frame of one particle that is moving with constant acceleration. Well, it happens to be a constant hyperbola. So of course it will be a hyperbolic coordinate transformation. You need to adapt it, right? Yeah. I guess the important bit here is the fact that this partial row vector field, it will not be normalized 
anywhere yeah. except on top of this uh, 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 trajectory there with acceleration a equals one. So that's important bit. This vector field will only be normalized and correspond to a, to a for a velocity on top of the trajectory with z equals one. Right. With the the space coordinates equals one. That's also and this yes. in this case here it's when x equals zero, big x equals zero. What as it should be. Yeah. As I'm, going should be, yeah. I'm going to say a triviality, but um, anyway, and the, and the, as, as far as I'm concerned, I think reference frame uh, proper reference frames are usually defined by the time coordinates. So the, the realer frame that you said is the, it's in the proper reference frame of anybody, it is the proper frame of the one, the guy that is in psi equal one, equals one, because there, the, it, it, there is nowhere where it says that the proper frame has to be the one that for the observer for which this proper, the spatial coordinate has to for be. For me, the, what I would call the proper frame is also center at your position at all times. Well, so that that you are again, in your proper frame, that's for you, that's right? X, X, no, that's for X. everyone, Jose. Come on. It's not. I mean, no, it's not because I mean you can ask anywhere anyone working in, in, in things in general relativity, they are going to say, okay, I have these coordinates. Uh, whose whose uh, whose proper coordinates are these? And they are going to look only at, at the time. They are not going to look if the X oh, is plus two. Again, or Jose, that's a preference thing. T typically, when you when I think of the notion of proper frame. I think I have a watch and I have a ruler and I put myself at the zero of the ruler. I'm fine with that, I'm, but in the sense that you can adapt everything that so that it, it, it's, it's, it's like that. But, but I think that to most people um, in, in working in these things, I, I, I mean, I, I think I think in general, you, if you ask somewhere, someone if these are the proper coordinates, proper co pro, the, it's the proper reference frame, the proper coordinates of some observer, they are going to say yes. I would say yes. Sure, and I would even say yes sometimes, but understanding that I'm abusing that. See what I mean? Yeah, I, I would say yeah. I, I think, you just I shift think, the space think, coordinate. That's I, right. I think, I think your notion of, of proper reference frame is no, not it's not an, not an abuse. abuse. My notion is not an abuse. No, I, I think it is, I think it is an so, abuse because no. because fixing the origin on the system is yeah. is just something arbitrary, and I've never I've never read. No, it's not that. arbitrary. Imagine imagine for example, Jose, that you have a scenario. That doesn't have time uh, space translational invariance, space uh, translation invariance. So, uh, it, so in that, that case, it. in that case, shifting is non-trivial, and you no, say, no, okay, no. how do I, I see it? If I want to compute, what do I measure? If I want my use my ruler to measure things and do an experiment, I better center it at zero for me. You know, I mean, for working, okay, but but but, but I mean, uh, strictly speaking, you can you can use for the distance. Uh, your the, the the coordinate that is in the I mean this this discussion is is is, is, is it is yeah, uh, you know yeah, 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 so yeah, let me ask one, <laughs> so trivial, let but, me but ask I, one I don't question. agree I don't agree question. that that zero is uh, anything okay. better than, than okay than, so than, it's, gonna, it's a matter of shifting it's a matter of shifting no I, shifting. I think we should skip this discussion but I will just make a comment that I'm on Jose's side okay yeah of course so, right, okay. I, I knew you were with me because I absolutely agree that the only thing that matters when you do rulers and clocks is differences not 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 agree, agree. but when we talk so I agree but the differences are not so necessarily one, linear one thing of the, the lack of translation the time doesn't have units right that's right so no let me ask my dimensions question. i mean sorry my yeah. so i think uh, that's, that's very important yeah. because the in the entanglement in mikowski and uh, it's not like, a, well, what is the difference between the Andrew effect in, in Schwarzschild, for instance, and the Andrew effect in Minkowski? So in Minkowski, the, the Andrew temperature, if you want, is one in the sense because uh, you do this calculation with this dimensionless uh, time and you get a 2 pi factor. So it's like a geometric factor. Whereas in other situations in which you don't have like uh, this... Um, uh, translation invariance, all that stuff is not a, just a geometric factor. It also depends on the mass of the black hole and stuff like that. So I think there's, a, yeah, I would say that this is not the proper time of anyone because it's not the it has a dimensionless the parameter that you're using. In any case, I think we shouldn't dwell on this though. I think everybody understands everybody though. As in, like, it's, nobody's going to teach anybody anything on this discussion. Yeah, it's a matter of I like it, I don't, right? Yeah. Now let me ask a, a real question. How much does the, this this equation here ensure thermality? And in a way that's a question that is very non-trivial. So uh, what I can tell you is that this so satisfying detail balance, or rather 
Well, if, let me just first, if you really truly satisfy detail balance, which is not this, this is weaker than detail balance. But if you truly satisfy detail balance, then that exactly. What this is telling you is that the detector is taking, because it's a perturbative calculation, all, what, all that this is telling you is that the detector is taking the right steps towards thermalization. By that, it means like, all right, neglecting the whole thermalization process, which is complicated, at least the detector is doing one thing that's necessary for the detector to thermalize with the dynamics, which is the probability of uh, going one way or another way. It's only a function of its population. It's, it's, the, it's the Bowman factor. So it's, it's basically, it's equally easy to get the excited than to get excited. That is a condition, that's the detail balance condition. And that condition is necessary for thermalization. So you're showing that you're taking the right steps. There are extra steps that you need, extra ingredients that you need in order to guarantee that the detector will thermalize. The assumption here is that we have them. Obviously, to answer the question properly, what you need to do is do a full non-perturbative calculation that's and show, possible. which sometimes you can do, as we have done in some papers, like the mirrors mm -hmm. for the, the cavity ones with them, we show full thermalization in that case. And there we're missing one little pie, which is much better than missing the A, right? Anyway, point being, point being just kidding. The point being that uh, there's one ingredient that you need, which is this detail balance. It's not the only ingredient that you need to prove that you thermalize. You also, if you have detail balance and you have ergodicity, and you have uh, uh, really truly infinitely long times or larger than, than the time that you need to go over the whole system, then for sure you can actually show with theorems that you would thermalize. But so ergodicity is the, is the. Yes, and ergodicity in the case of the field case is more like Poincare recursivity, and those things are more complicated. It is assumed that the system has in the full non perturbative dynamics of the detector, it is assumed to be ergodic. Now, you will start reading and you would see that people tell you, oh, this is a linear interaction. It's not ergodic <laughs> and so on. So those are the non-trivial parts, but it's actually, uh, those are assumptions that are made that the dynamics will definitely be ergodic, they're true dynamics, right? So this plus ergodicity or in the infinite dimensional case, something more a little bit more complicated, which is related to Poincaré notion of ergodicity that is difficult to prove and to work with. That's the extra assumption that you need in order to guarantee that it's thermalized. But of course, nobody can, no, even intuitively, right? A perturbative calculation will not tell you if you, if you thermalize. Thermalization is very non-perturbative in nature. You start at temperature zero and you want to get a thousand Kelvin. Well, that's not going to be perturbative. <laughs> so there's a lot of back reaction and talking, also leading order. To thermalize, you need to know, you need to give your information, get information about the system, but also give your information to the system. The both systems that are in thermal contact need to get to know each other. This calculation, the detector gets to know about the field, but the field doesn't get to know about the detector. The back reaction is neglected on the, the cross-talking between the detector after the field says, oh, hold on, there's a fucking detector. I'm going to push on that detector now. This is higher order. And that thing is not taken into account in a little order calculation. So of course, a perturbative calculation will never show thermalization. But again, there are extra assumptions that seem reasonable. This one is the one that is tougher uh, if you don't have this one, for sure you don't thermalize. And it is assumed that all realistic interactions are ergodic. So even if your linear model happens not to be ergodic, it's assumed that in reality, you know, the fact that the detector is, uh, is more realistic, there would be extra terms that make it non-ergodic, that make it ergodic, et cetera, et cetera. Or at least sufficiently enough ergodic. You don't even need to be fully ergodic. You just need to be approximately ergodic. And even though, even, even more so in a field, you don't even have to go over all the states. You need to be arbitrarily close to all the states in enough time. And then that arbitrarily close, you can relax it and call it epsilon close. And epsilon close is kind of the sensitivity of your thermometer in a way, right? So those assumptions, we kind of wave our hands around. Yeah, ergodicity we have in reality, mm -hmm. at least approximately. This is the one that is certainly not trivial to wave your hands around. You need to compute. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, again, this is the whole discussion. Yeah. And yeah, given the little time that we have after this, I guess, uh, yeah. If, you, if you're writing a paper, so Thales is writing a single author paper on this. If you're writing a paper on this, I would actually make a small discussion about, this is not thermalization, but it's all that, we all agree that this is very reasonably thermalization. <laughs> you know what I, mean? yeah, I have the room for this discussion. That's why I wanted to ask you about it. You're gonna try PRL? <laughs> what? You're gonna try PRL? Should I? I don't know. I wasn't thinking about that. Not even close. Ah, you said room. Should something I? about room. That's why I was asking. Oh, no, no. I have like the room, like I have the, the paragraph, like. Ah, you let, let you know? <laughs> us. Yeah, I see. I see. Yeah.
Uh, we can help with that for sure. We can discuss all that. Thermalization is, again, thermalization is still an open problem in many ways. You know, there's a lot that we know, but a lot that we don't know. For finite dimensions, it is kind of well known how things kind of work. It's the scrambling, right? The maximum scrambling. That's the closest you can get to thermalization. But in infinite dimensions, there's a lot still that's non-trivial. For quantum field, as usual, quantum field's always messing things up, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, okay. Uh, I guess we, we better head to the logistics. Oh, before right? we it's finish the recording, uh, at some point, Jose Polo is going to talk again, revisit again, fluctuation, dissipation theorems, and all those things. And that's going to be good because that's things that are related to thermalization, things that are related to equilibrium in thermodynamics. So he's going to give, give a little, he has done uh, for the course of stochastic processes, one of the applied math courses he took, he's done, uh, uh, he's done some work on this. So he's going to tell us about that, right, Jose? Am I right? Yeah, I don't know because I was trying to change the topic of next week. Oh, that's important in logistics, and we'll talk about it afterwards. Let me stop the recording. Well, let's thank Thales again. Right. That was a great, that's a great topic. I think you're doing a great job of all doing it on your own too. Like, Thanks. good to have this kind of, it's, it's great, honestly. It's a really good choice for a single author paper. Thanks, boy. Uh, it was very nice feedback today. And uh, hopefully, yeah. <laughs> All right, let me start the recording.